Welcome back, everybody. This is episode 87 at Streets and Eats. And today on the podcast, we are taking you to Ireland and the Wild Atlantic Way. This is one of our favorite areas to road trip. You can do stages. You can do, if you have the time, you could do like a month long trip, but however you do it, it's incredible. Welcome to Streets and Eats, the travel and food podcast dedicated to taking our listeners to the sights, sounds, and flavors of fascinating places near and far, both on and off the beaten path. We're Jim and Corinne Vale, and we've been traveling internationally and domestically together for decades, visiting more than 90 countries in all 50 states in the USA. We'll share all of the local knowledge and food expertise we've gathered through years of living as expats in Asia and Europe, as well as traveling with families spanning multiple generations around the world. Join us each week for a new adventure. Okay, I get the trivia question this week, so let's get right into it. There is a famous celebration that started in Ireland and has since spread around the world. What is this celebration that is still as popular in Ireland as it is in the States and other countries? It's not St. Patrick's Day. It is not St. Patrick's Day. Because that started in the States. And it's much more popular in the States than it is in Ireland and other countries. Um, Halloween. Yes, it is Halloween. Oh, you knew it. No, I did know it. I was guessing. I just figured that that would be the one that that would be least likely to be chosen perhaps so well i'm impressed but i'm yeah, also a little because you know upset. brain power <laughs> yeah halloween was invented in ireland its roots go back two thousand years to the celtic festival Samhain, uh, which is celebrated at the end of summer october all saints and all that eventually evolved from it the idea of dressing up and chasing away evil spirits offering food and candies uh, to the dead or to the fairies and spirits all started there and it's still it's still a popular holiday there, celebration there. Oh, do they do it the way the Americans do? Yeah, because the Americans, of course, took a lot of those traditions uh, from the Irish and the Scottish. I, I think Halloween has maybe evolved even more so in the last, I don't know, decade or whatever, because we lived in Germany before and Germans never celebrated Halloween. Nowadays, no matter where you are in the world, you've got Halloween decorations and you've got pumpkins and you've got pumpkin spice lattes and you've got all kinds of <laughs> right. things that are Halloweeny, so to speak. But I was surprised when I came back to Germany and they were actually trick or treating. We had, we didn't have many because we live in a very small. <laughs> yeah, there's not many people here to begin small with. Small village. But we still had trick or treaters at our door that are just little German children all dressed up with their bags and looking for candy. It was funny though, because in the States, you know, if you find a house where they're giving the big candy bars or the, or the, you know, really good candies, then that's the one that everybody tells their friends they must go to. And they're like, yeah, pile it on. If you gave them two, three, they would just be happy here. I was trying to get my three-year-old grandson to give them candy. So I put one in and then I wanted him to put one in and I I kept showing him how to do it. (laughs) And finally the little girl where I was doing this was like, okay, that's enough. (laughs) Yeah. Stop. Stop. (laughs) That's more than I was supposed to get. My mom's standing over there. I'm sure she's going to yell at me. It was just too funny. That is funny. Well, yeah, you're right. There's a lot more of it now in Germany than there used to be. In fact, what I remember kids dressing up and doing any type of trick or treat type things was more like foshing time where kids would be in their foshing costumes. And if they stopped you and asked you for money, you had to give them some change. Well, I'm sure they still do that. I'm sure they do. But now they get another chance to collect candy. Halloween has come and gone here, of course. Uh, And now we're getting snow, which I love. Yeah, today is the end end of November. And I was surprised that we would have snow this early at all. The last time we lived in Germany, we did get snow where we lived in uh, northern Bavaria. But I don't think we got that much. And I don't know that we got it as early as November. I think a lot of the snow comes, you know, after Christmas usually. Yeah. Um, Sometimes during Christmas, but usually after Christmas. And here we are at the end of November already getting snow. So I hope that's a good sign because I would love to have a white Christmas here. That would be beautiful, wouldn't it? You know, speaking of changes in weather and snow and whatnot, we were just in Switzerland and 
the hotel we were staying in, remember, was like right next to a gondola. And we were thinking, oh, this would be a great place to come back to and take that gondola and go do some skiing. But when we asked the the proprietor proprietor at the hotel about the gondola, she said, oh, no, so sad. It has stopped running because of budgets. The snow doesn't come down far enough and doesn't last long enough to support the ski season here anymore. So global warming, whether you believe in climate change or not, the evidence is there for sure. And it's affecting people and it's affecting their livelihoods and it's affecting our quality of life. Yeah, it really is. It's really sad. So while we're happy to get some snow here earlier in the year, November, December timeframe, that's amazing. The sad truth is it's changing everywhere. Meantime, what it means for us is, you know, it's before Christmas. And so there's Christmas markets open all over Europe. And we've done quite a few already, quite frankly, we have a lot more to do. But what it means is that you're going to probably be walking around in freezing rain because the temperatures are pretty right. low. Um, it's It hovers right around freezing. And that's why it was nice that it was actually snowing instead of just raining. Yeah. But boy, when it does start, that freezing rain turns to snow while you're at a Christmas market. That's... Just magical. magical. That's super cool. Well, it's also changing, of course, the summers. Summers are getting hotter and hotter and hotter uh, and lasting longer. And that was true in Ireland when we were just there in uh, September, October, early October. It was nice weather. And considering it was the beginning of October, it could have been cold and dreary. Uh, but for the most part, it was really nice with a little bit of rain, but not too cold. So on this last trip, we were kicking around what to do. We had five days and we knew we wanted to do some of the wild Atlantic way. And what we have have like experienced in the past is, yeah, sure, you can do in five days, you could probably drive from County Cork in the south all the way up to Donegal County in the north. In fact, we ran into a couple. I don't think they were doing it in five days. I think they had... Maybe 10 days. Uh, I think they had seven days. What, whatever it was. We ran into a couple um, along the way. We were actually riding the ferry with them to Innismore. And um, that's exactly what they were doing. But it was funny because they said we're, we're just exhausted because yeah. we've done so much and we haven't really taken any time off. So you can do it. Yeah, I guess that's the answer is you can do the whole wild Atlantic way in one, you know, trip if that is your goal and you know what you're doing and you've got your stops planned out and you can see quite a bit. And even if you don't stop everywhere, because there's tons of places to stop, um, you're still going to have a really good time. You just might be tired at the end of it. <laughs> yeah, right. You can be road weary, so to speak. The scenery is gorgeous everywhere you go in Ireland and especially on the Atlantic coast. So it's just going to be a beautiful drive, even if you don't have a lot of time, but you want to make a lot of distance. But what we decided for this trip was let's just kind of focus on one area, one section and do everything we can in that area. And I think that really was the way to go. Well, that I think is the definition of slow travel, isn't it? Yeah. That you pick instead of trying to do so much, you pick an area and you concentrate on that area. And yes, that's what we did. But we also had limited time on this trip. We weren't really going. I mean, we're travelers at heart. So, of course, no matter when we go anywhere, we're going to go do things and enjoy them and see new sites, hopefully. And, right. you know, that's that's our livelihood. But at the same token, that wasn't the main reason that we went there. We went there to get out of the Schengen zone for a few days and restart our Schengen time. And that's what we were concentrating on. So this was just sort of like a bonus trip anyway. And even we've been to the Cliffs of Moore twice now because that was the second time we went. Um, and it was exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> surprise, surprise. don't change a lot over the course of a couple of years. Well, yeah, but I mean, the weather was the same. It was exactly. exact same. Yeah. And we went the first time that we went to the Cliffs of Moore, we went in the summer. And this time we went in the fall. And it was exactly the same. Okay, so let's get some facts about the Wild Atlantic Way. Because this podcast is about our top 10 sites that we've seen on the parts of the Wild Atlantic Way that we have traveled. Like I said, if you look up the Wild Atlantic Way, it's like 2,500 kilometers long. And I mean, it goes the full length of Ireland. Yeah. 
Ireland is full, in case you didn't know this, of cute little towns with cute little pubs, with wonderful sites, with historical castles, with, you know, it's right on the coast. It's gorgeous. So there's tons to do. Road trips galore. And yet you have to either, like we said, do a full trip and pick and choose some of the places you want to stop at or go multiple times. And that's what we've done. So we picked our top 10 sites between a few different trips for things that we've done, because we've done quite a bit on the Wild Atlantic Way, but not not all at once. So like you said, it's really best to break it up and do it in over the course of multiple trips. I mean, everybody wants to go to Ireland. And once you've been once, you want to go back. Well, we run into so many people there. And I would have to say that most of the people that we run into are American. I think that's sure. probably their highest group of people that come to visit other than maybe from the UK, which is right there. And I don't think we ran into anyone. I'm trying to think. There were a few people that were like wives or, or spouses that said, yes, it was their first time, but their significant other had already been back. And was bringing them back to places that they really loved. Yeah. that. So, so the only people we ran into that were not returning were people that were with married somebody. to or with someone who was returning. In other words, once you go to Ireland, it's like you want to keep going back. And we've been there ourselves, I don't know, oh. four or five times. Yeah. I'm not even sure how many times. Quite not, a few. Yeah, I'm not sure either. And we've had a great time. Every single Every time. time. So I really think it's the best idea is to just pick one of the regions. Um, there's six of them and then focus on that region and then plan another trip and come back and go to a different region. Or two regions. It depends oh, yeah. on how much, how much time, time you have, have and, and what interests you in those places. I think most tourists are looking for castles. Right. I think most tourists are looking for good food. Mm-hmm. I think, um, you know, museums prehistoric sites some well what i'm saying is there are some things that are good to stop and see but you might not be as interested in them like some people are just not museum goers even though we love a good museum even us we don't do tons of museums we just do certainly don't do every one we come across heck no we would never be finished yeah so there are six regions so you can do the northern headlands the surf coast which was surprising to me the idea of surfing in ireland until I saw it. And then, yeah, it makes perfect sense. They have some great waves um, and some good beaches. The Bay Coast, the Cliff Coast, the Southern Peninsulas, and the Haven Coast. Uh, they're all unique. They're all beautiful. It's not like you start driving on one section of the Wild Atlantic Way, and by the time you get to the other end, you're thinking, oh, cliffs, oh, ocean, oh, beach, seen it, done it. I mean, it is spectacular and different all in all the different regions. So that's pretty cool. And there's wildlife. Well, maybe not so wild. There is tame life <laughs> like um, sheep. There's lots of sheep with multicolored butts. And those are always fun to look at. Oh, there's a purple butt. Oh, there's a blue butt. Oh, there's a pink butt. <laughs> I just love that. Um, sometimes they're standing in the middle of the road. They're always looking at you. And I don't know, we've never really been able to pet them, but they've always been pretty close. The same with sometimes you'll see ponies. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you'll see cows. Um, Not as much as sheep, though. You mostly see sheep. Some horses, but yeah, sheep are the most. My favorite sheep spotting was, I think it was on on the Dingle Peninsula we were driving around. And there was a sheep standing up on the stone wall at the edge of the road. Yeah. But the only thing about that was, you couldn't see over. The edge of the road was a cliff that dropped straight yeah. down to the ocean. It's what it looked like anyway. Uh, and as we got closer, the sheep... Jumps off. Jumped off the <laughs> it cliff. It was like it was committed suicide. <laughs> it's like, oh, off it goes. But of course, it was Hopefully a sheep. It, didn't. it knew uh, what it was doing. It knew what it was doing. But that's pretty cool. And the sheep are just... They make the trip. They're beautiful. I love seeing them on the on the stone walls and on the pastures, and it's just beautiful. And of course, everywhere it's green. But there's hiking, there's surfing, there's whale watching, puffins, birds. Oh yeah, it's all there. That's a lot of fun. Um, some of the places that you might recognize the names that it goes through, like Jim said, there's the Dingle Peninsula, there's the County Kerry, there's Limerick and Sligo and um, Donegal, one of my favorite places, uh, County Cork. There's just so much to see and do all along the entire route. And I think it's hard to pick and choose what to do. Get outside of Dublin and go to the Wild Atlantic Way for sure. Right. 
leave Dublin. Um, I think some of the most fun things to do, and we did a lot of this, especially on this last trip, because we have a friend who lives there and she took us, is going into the pubs, having a pub dinner or pub lunch. And usually, at least on the weekends, but sometimes more often than that, you'll have live uh, music. And it's a, it's such a old tradition, yet it's still being kept up. And our friend Anne, whom we went to visit, she is a singer and she took us to a pub where she was invited to sing because they knew her, um, but she wasn't part of the band. She was just a guest singer, I guess. And um, it's just, you know, it's it's informal. They're sitting around singing. They invite people from the audience. They talk to you. They I, what I found interesting, and I maybe wouldn't have noticed this just as an innocent bystander who isn't as into music as other people, is that one of the things they did was um, they had three musicians, and not all of them sang. But some of them sang, some of them didn't Mm -hmm. sing. And, but what they did as musicians is they would be playing a tune, do, 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 whatever, you know, I don't know the tunes. (laughs) And then they would turn it into another tune. And then the other musicians, because it wasn't like on a playlist, the other musicians be like, oh, oh, okay, I got it. Oh yeah, I know this one. And they would fall in and then they'd remember the notes. It was just pretty impressive actually and what i found fascinating was they would do that for a good 10 minutes just going from tune to tune to tune and it all sounded incredible and beautiful and it was just a lot of fun toe tapping music but then when they would get done they'd stop and they'd start talking about the tunes that they were playing and a lot of times they didn't know the name they didn't know the name (laughs) yeah one person might know it and, and maybe they all knew it but they would just talk about the tunes that they played and what they were and it's just really cool to see that that like heritage and as i said music is not that important to me i know it is to a lot of people but it isn't to me so Mm -hmm. it's not something that i was ever that maybe interested in doing and the few times that we came around or came across the live music i was like oh yeah that's nice i enjoyed it don't get me wrong i've always enjoyed it but i never Like I never sought it out, but now after having gone with somebody who was able to tell us a little bit more about what was going on, because I didn't realize all that was going on behind the scenes. Um, I I find it even that much more kind of endearing that much more of a, something that you want to do. It's probably UNESCO world inherit intangible. I'll bet. Oh, I bet it is. It must be because it it definitely is. It should be. Yeah. Something very unique and cultural to to Ireland, which is pretty amazing. So anyway, we're going to talk about our top sites of things that we've done on the Wild Atlantic Way. Um, and we'll probably stick in more information about Ireland along the way and things to eat. And, you know, those are our favorite stuff. So that's what we're always talking about. I agree. Um, I already mentioned one of them is the Cliffs of Moher. Everybody's heard of the Cliffs of Moher. We've been twice. I think the site itself is, it's, it's beautiful. It's nice. I I guess it's not my favorite. You can probably tell. I'm just, I've been there twice and both times, like I said, it was the exact same experience pretty much. Um, and I just, I, I, I don't know. It's not, it's, it's not my favorite. No. Well, it's not my favorite. They are beautiful, but you know, cliffs for me, and maybe this is where you're getting at too. It's kind of like waterfalls. Waterfalls are beautiful. But when you've seen it, I mean, you're done. You've looked over the cliffs, you've seen it, you're done. It is a nice place to walk, but because it is so popular, uh, it's very crowded at the Cliffs of Moher. There's like coach after coach after coach, even in Well, we were counting them. How many did we count? We counted 155, I think, or something like that. And this was on an October Wednesday morning. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of people there. So it's not, it's not like a, uh hidden gem or anything like that you can get a little bit further away from like the official cliffs of more and there are some really nice cliff walks that you can do where you're away from the crowds uh, and those are nice walks to do well and when you go in i mean the site itself is well set up it's got good parking there's a beautiful visitor center that talks about you know the geography of the area mm-hmm. the wildlife of the area the fish that are in the area um that's that's always nice I do like that because I think it gives you some background, some sort of, you know, information that you might not otherwise be able to discern just from being there. Um, But for me, I I think it's just it's almost too popular for me. I'd rather go somewhere 
less popular. Um, other cliffs that we went to were the Sleeve Leaf Cliffs. Which are much taller and much more impressive and not as crowded. And, and I love those much, much beautiful. more. That is and the hiking area. around there was gorgeous. You have this much smaller parking lot. I don't remember if it was free. It wasn't much. It wasn't anything like going yeah. to the Cliffs of Moore, of course. I mean, it's just a completely different thing. But they were stunning. I enjoyed them much, much more. I mean, the cliffs were, for them, are 1,900 feet tall. The cliffs of Moore are probably larger, and you can certainly see them. Actually, they're not larger. No, they're not. No, the Sleevely Cliffs are, are quite a bit taller than the yeah. Cliffs of Moore. But the Cliffs of Moore, I think, are more accessible. Well, and there's cruises. That go by there, which I think is a good way to do it, probably, because the views would be better. Although the day that we were on the boat and the boat was going to the Cliffs of Moore, we didn't go to the Cliffs of Moore with the boat. We got off before it went there. But we we had gone to Ennis Moore, which we'll talk about. And that was spectacular. But the water was rough, choppy, (laughs) rough, choppy. Yeah. Choppy is a kind way of putting it. In fact, I think the people that... We're staying on the boat and continuing on the cruise. It got cut short because it was just too rough. Well, they let some people off. I don't know if they (laughs) continued with everybody else who didn't want to get off, but they definitely made, um, there were some people who were getting so sick that they made a stop, a special stop and said, here, you can get off before you finish the tour. That tells you something. But I love a good bumpy, bumpy boat ride. So for me, it was fun. And that was one of the... One of the things I really liked about the next place I want to talk about, which is Skellig Michael. Um, Skellig Michael is a small island off the coast of County Kerry. It's in the south. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And I think most people know about it because of the Star Wars movies. There's a scene where Luke is coming out of this beehive hut on this gorgeous green island. And yeah, that's Skellig Michael. And that's my favorite spot. Because that is my favorite first spot of all, too. Skellig Michael is just amazing. It's windswept. You have to climb 600 steps to get to the top. And when I say climb steps, I'm not talking about, you know, a wooden staircase with a railing. No, 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 no. no. I'm talking about, you know, very thin, unevenly spaced rock stairs, which by the way, when it rains is very, very, very treacherous. And, and it, it didn't rain for us on the way up. It rained for us on the way down, which I actually think is probably even more dangerous. You had puffins within two feet of you. So yes. that was amazing. Sharing, the, other thing sharing I, the trail with you. Yeah. And the other thing I thought was nice about it is because it is such a, a gem and it's such a fragile ecosystem that they only let something like 80 people go per day. Yeah, it's very tightly controlled. And so you, if you plan on going to Skellig Michael, you really need to plan ahead. And I know people, in fact, I just had a friend who tried to go there. And because the water was so bad, they were they didn't get to go. Yeah. So even if you've planned it a year in advance and you've got your your reservation and you're hoping to go, it's still completely up to the weather on the day that you get there. Well, we even almost the, day, didn't get to go. the day that we went, the water was really choppy and, and they canceled the day before. And so we were a little bit worried about it. Um, but they took us and we were fine and we got to do the whole thing. And like I said, it did start raining on the way down. And I think if that rain had been there and it had been that choppy going in, we wouldn't have gotten there. No, well, they canceled the rest of the day after we left, actually. So because it anyway, was bad. it was fantastic. Whether you're a Star Wars fan or whether you're a Puffin fan or whether you just like to go find old monastic settlements that are pretty impressive that these people lived way up on this mountain, very hard to get to. Uh, it's just a, it's an incredible it's, place. it is my favorite place by far. But if you do want to see the puffins, you got to get there before August, because after August, all the babies are grown up enough and they all head back out to sea for the winter. When did we go? I think we were there in July. July. Perfect time. Yeah, it was perfect. So there are a couple of really good drives that are also attractions, uh, one of which is the Ring of Kerry. Mm. Um, I think most people have probably heard of it. Or the Dingle Peninsula. Or the both Dingle of those Peninsula. Are, are drives. Those are both top spots along the route. Rugged mountains, picturesque towns, stunning coastal views. One point on the Ring of Kerry, you're kind of driving up and over through some mountains and back down towards the coast. And there's like these stunning deep blue lakes that just kind of dot the countryside around you. 
and they're just beautiful. It's a great place to get out and walk around. And like you mentioned before, the sheep. And there's waterfalls. And waterfalls, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's beautiful and it's well worth going to. And um, it's close to towns that are really cool as well. The Dingle Peninsula in County Kerry, uh, I think, is a little bit more dramatic even than the Ring of Kerry. It is definitely a smaller road and you get much closer to the scenery. There are some beaches in that area. And the towns are just like beautiful little villages, exactly what you think of Ireland. Yeah. And and now that you mention it, the Dingle Peninsula is such a good example of people from, especially from the States, learning to drive or renting a car and driving on these (laughs) little tiny Irish roads. I remember at one point, because it's so windy and it's, you know, it's uphill and it's downhill and it's sometimes the road is is wide enough and you don't really think about it, but there are parts of the road that are very narrow as well. And we came around, we're coming down the hill and we come around one turn and it says slow. No, it goes slow down. Then it's the next um, turn. It said slower. And then the very next turn is go more slow. It's like, it wants you to slow down. It was was really pretty funny. The Dingle Peninsula and the Ring of Kerry are both stunning drives. But for me, there's one drive. It's like a little ring that goes out along a peninsula. That is probably the most unique landscape in Ireland. Uh, And that's the Burren. If you get a chance to do a drive around the Burren, it's incredible. It's an old, like geological, glacial area, mm. volcanic area where the land was stripped and striped by glaciers. And there's these erratic boulders that are left standing in precarious positions all throughout the landscape. Well, and it's kind of flat. I mean, it does gain some a- a- elevation. But overall, the landscape is rather flat because the glacial, the glacier went right through there. So it flattened everything out. Mm-hmm. And so these erratics are like, here's this flat nothing. And then here's this huge boulder. Here's some flat nothing. Here's this huge boulder. It's really pretty cool. And what the nicest thing about the burn, I think, is that it is close to the cliffs of Moor. And for me, it made the trip to be able to for go sure. to the burn. And there is a prehistoric dolmen there. We love finding a dolmen because those are always really cool. And the towns around there are just really, really sweet. And there's always good little food places to eat at. And we found in a butcher a nice little cafe where we had the best, the best sandwiches of the whole trip. And yeah, um, it just things like that. To me, that makes it that much more of a, a successful trip than just going to a site and saying, oh, yeah, there's some cliffs. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Anyway, so I thought the Burren really, really was fun. It was pretty unique. And yeah, it's also a UNESCO global geopark, Mm. which is pretty cool. Speaking of parks, there's the Connemara National Park, too, which is basically not far from there. It's um, located in County Galway, which is right up the road, actually. Mm -hmm. And this visitor's park has beaches and has all kinds of really um, beautiful untouched landscapes um, and hiking trails. And again, little towns dotted throughout. Mm-hmm. I just think it's so nice. With cozy little pubs. Mm-hmm. That's what I love about Ireland. There's always a cozy little pub somewhere around the corner with a nice Guinness and some really delicious food. I can skip the Guinness, but they also have nice apple ciders and stuff too. Oh, yeah. I think another one of my favorite things, and this is one we just did on this last trip, is Innismore and the Aran Islands. Mm. And the Aran Islands are known for their sheep and their wool, and you'll see lots of Aran Island sweaters for sale. That's right. On the island, you will see this all over the place, but you will also see it elsewhere Ireland. in Ireland because it is that popular. And then there's a um, big, huge fortress on the island that everybody goes to called Dun Angasa. I think I said that right. Don't, don't, don't <laughs> well, yell at me if I didn't. Over 3000 years old and it's an old stone fort, a uh, stone ring fort, and you have to climb up to the cliff side. Okay. So you got to have a little bit of background before you talk about that. Okay. So th- when you get to Ennis Moor, there are a couple ways to get around the island. You can take a horse and buggy cart. Right. You can take a van. A you can take tour. a tour. You can hike. We saw some hikers. In fact, one of one group of them had to pick me up as I <laughs> crashed on the ground because the other way to do it is to go by bike. And of course you can take regular bikes or you can take e-bikes. And we 
rented e-bikes for the day, which was the so way to go. much fun. Um, but like I said, I did crash and they did have to pick me up. And that was really sweet of them. Well, you say you crashed, but really I crashed. It was from a standstill, you were trying to get going and the pedals got mixed up and you just kind of fell over. You didn't, you weren't riding down the road and crash. That would have been horrible. Yeah. Uh, this was more like a slow motion. This is more like over. a, this is quirky kind of accident where I just can't handle myself and I just fall over and yeah. get hurt. That's, that's what happens. It happens but anyway, occasionally. <laughs> it happens a lot. <laughs> anyway. So one of the, the places that you're heading for is Dunangasa, this big fortress. So we're, we ride our bikes and we go all the way to the end of the road where it says you can't take your bikes anymore. And there is a parking lot there. So we're like, I guess we're going to park our bike there. Now we're the type of people that go, to things pretty early. So we had gotten off our ferry. We had rented our bike, which it, we had pre-booked and we had taken off. And, yeah. and there were, I think there were two bikes in the parking lot before us. Only two. Yeah. Not, when we came down many. the mountain, there must've been 50. The bikes were there. The coaches were there. The horse and buggies were there. It was crowded. It was crowded. So we parked our bikes and then we're like, now what do we do? So there's a little visitor yeah, center. Because you couldn't really tell what to you do. You couldn't tell. There was the signage was lacking. It yeah, was there. It was. But it was lacking. So the first thing we see is the bathrooms. And we're like, okay, well, you know, it's been, I don't know, 30 minutes or whatever. So that was always it's always a welcome sight. <laughs> and if we hadn't had to go to the bathroom, I don't know that we would have found the visitor center. No. And there were other people that were confused because we were all confused. And actually we pulled up and one of the two other bikes, the guy who was riding it was sitting at a picnic table just outside of a little uh, stand where they were selling coffee and homemade baked goods. Yummy. We, so we, we couldn't thought, resist. Hey, he's doing it. We might as well do it too. And since we really didn't have a clue what we were going to do next, yeah, we got a coffee and a scone and enjoyed it. And it was probably one of the best scones we had on the whole trip. And then, yeah, where are the bathrooms? Because after your coffee, coffee, you get hit to the bathrooms. And once we walked around the building towards the bathrooms, that's when you come into this little courtyard and you, you see know, the entrance. I just realized it's at a store. It's at a... There's a knitting store. Or a, there's a, a store there. I'll bet you anything store. if you had walked into the store, it gives you directions to it. Well, uh, no wonder actually the store was, was open on both sides of the building. So if you had walked into the store and looked around, you would have right then seen the visitor center and the ticket, the ticket area. I think that was very purposeful now that I think back on it. Probably, but we typically don't go into the stores. Especially at the beginning of a trip. If we're going to go shopping, we're going to save that. So we're not carrying it around all day, but you know. Each to their own, I guess. Uh, we did figure it out. We mm -hmm. paid a couple of euros that it cost to walk up there. And when you get up there. Well, okay. But, but so you start on this walk and it doesn't really give you much of an idea of how far it is. No, no, So we all, get on actually. this, we get on this path and it's very pretty and we stop and we, you know, we're videoing and we're taking pictures and we're just taking our time. And then it kind of dawns on us. It's like, how flipping far is this? Where is this fort? I don't see a fort. And then you kind of like follow the path up with your eyes and you're like, Oh, that's much further than I was expecting. And it's steep. much further, not just steep, but uneven. Yeah. It's not a paved path. It's broken rock is the best way to explain it. Yeah. And sometimes that broken rock works really well for steps and sometimes it doesn't. Well, let's put it this way. We were doing it on our own, which many people did the same thing we did, but there was also many people many people who had taken a tour. Mm -hmm. And so I stopped some and I'm like, are you on a tour? Cause I just had to know. I'm like, how much time do they give you to do this? Cause you know how tours are here. We are, we're at the Louvre. You got 20 minutes. Don't be, don't be late. Right. So I'm thinking how much, I mean, how much time could they, how, I, I just couldn't imagine. I just had no idea. So I had to ask them, I'm like, how much time do they give you? Do you know they give you two, two hours? hours. Who's paying for a tour where you're on your own for two hours anyway? To me, yeah. that's just ridiculous. Yeah, I don't know how much they pay for it, but it was nice to have our bikes and be on our own time. That's for sure. We weren't there for two hours, even with the cup of coffee and the scone that we enjoyed before no, we but went up there. We were, I mean, we could have easily used two hours. We just didn't because that's And if we, we were shoppers, we'd have spent time in the shop. I'm sure they factor that in. 
And in fact, the trail was steep and difficult, so much so that we met people coming down who were pretty much giving up on their way up. They had stopped and decided, I'm not going to make it. I'm just going to turn around and go back. Yeah, it was it was much rougher than I expected. And I think a lot of people expected. You just didn't expect it. It was a hike. It was nice, though. And then once you get up there, you're in the fort. It's just a fort. It's just a wall. It's and just the, the walls. views are spectacular. Well, that was for sure. The ring is built in a circle at the edge of a cliff, a very sheer cliff that's very high up. And the cliff, in fact, makes one wall of the fort going down. And it's just open. Like you step to the edge and you hang your toes off and it's, I don't know, 200 feet down. And there's no rail. There's no rope keeping you back. There's no signs. because... There was a lady there. I'm like, do you work here? And she said, yeah. I said, what is your job? She goes, well, I'm just a watcher. I'm here to answer a few questions. I'm like, so if someone gets hurt or someone falls over, she goes, we've never had anyone fall. I said, but if you did have someone fall, she goes, you wouldn't make it. Don't worry about it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm like, okay. That's what I thought. (laughs) She was pretty fun. It was funny. Uh, But it was a beautiful place. And just, you know, riding our bikes around in this more was Spectacular. the best of that particular trip. It definitely is right up there with a visit to Skellig Michael. I'd be hard pressed to like put one over the other as far as which one I liked better. Well, I think it's a different Skellig experience. Michael gives you a little bit. I think that one, not everybody does because it's just so hard to get one of those 80 slots during your time. That if it's rainy, you can't go, and it's only during this season, and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so it I, I don't think it's 80 slots. It's 80 boats, something like that. I think like it's that. 80 at one time, 80 people on the island at one time. Anyway, it's so very- So they keep rotating in and out, so you only have no more than 80 people on the it's island. It's very regulated. Um, so that makes it, to me, that makes it a little bit more of a- More puts special, Puts it a little bit sure. higher up, because the less people have done it. And as we noticed when we were in this morning- Lots of people were doing that. In fact, more than I expected, because I thought, you know, this is also something that's a little bit harder to do. You've got to take a ferry to get out there. Um, So I was surprised at how many people were there. There were so many people there that all the pubs in town were full, including the one we ate at. We just happened to get there right before it completely filled up. Yeah, that's right. So we could talk a little bit about food to eat. Well, one thing. Okay. So there's a few things that you're going to have when you're in Ireland. Guaranteed. Yeah. You're going to have fish and chips. chowder or fish soup. <laughs> fish pie. Fish pie. Which fish I and love. Chips. Fish. You're going to have fish. They love fish. And the fish was delicious and fresh and it was yeah, really good. I was good. trying to think if we ever had a bad fish dish. We had in- We had a lackluster one in at one of the pubs. Where the music was amazing uh, and the drink was great and- we had a good time. We had a fish pie that was, was just okay. It was more cream than fish. Yeah. And more uh-huh. potato than filling. So and we, we did, just had that really good one. Yeah. That makes the difference. You know, when Cornwall. you have something to, to compare it to, if there, we if you've had a great one, it's like, eh. Mm. Yeah. The bar is pretty high for fish pie, uh, but that was still pretty good. Well, the one thing I thought you were going to say in Ireland, you're going to have, you should have an Irish breakfast. A full Irish breakfast. Well, I think that that's usually not a problem because most people are staying in hotels or B&Bs that have breakfast. Um, we we stay with a friend. We also stayed in a and b and we also stayed in a couple of hotels during mm-hmm. our trip. Um, the hotels, um, we didn't end up springing for the breakfast because we like going out to a bakery and, yeah, and seeing right. what's available. But the B&B, of course, offered a fantastic breakfast. And that was near the Cliffs of Moore. So if you're going there, you definitely want to look at the um, farmhouse B&B because that's where we, we stayed and the rooms were cute and the breakfast was, I would say, five-star breakfast. Yeah. Well, it was delicious. The day before, we ate in the Doolin Cafe. Yeah, that was pretty good, too. That was phenomenal. But it wasn't. But I thought the bed and breakfast was just that much better. Yeah. The Doolin Cafe was one of those places that um, we didn't really, there's not a whole lot of just cafes or restaurants true. for breakfast. So we, again, we went there and by the time, shoot, I think we were the last persons to get a table that didn't have to wait. 
everybody else had to wait. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, if you're waiting for a full breakfast, it's at least what half an hour or whatever. That's right. But nobody seemed to mind. And it was a good breakfast. Uh, Fish and chips for sure. Shepherd's pie is always really good. Irish stew. Irish stew. We had a couple of really good Irish You can find that everywhere. And then, I mean, they're used to Americans. So there was a lot of barbecue. I mean, I was surprised at how much barbecue there was. There's, of course, if you have children, especially, there was a lot of fast food from the state. So, you know, and I and I'm of two thoughts with that. We will stop at them as well. Like we did even stop at McDonald's on this last stop because there's always something that's unique to the area. But it's also kind of nice for the kids to do something where they're not always trying something always new. Always trying something new. Just give them something they like and make them happy and move on. So I always think that's a good reason to stop there. I so agree. I'm not an anti-American food person when you're on the road. Lots of good food though. I don't think we had really any bad food. Mm-mm. I think it was a little bit more expensive than I was expecting to be honest. I think the pandemic did that. Yeah, so pandemic, many people well, lost their inflation around the world is killing everything. That's true. It was li- definitely a little bit more expensive than I remembered Ireland being in the past on this last trip. There's so many great places to stay. You really just have to look at the region you're going to be exploring. And, you know, I'm of two minds. One is you're starting from point A and continuing for a couple of days on up to point B, C, D, E, whatever. And you're going to stay somewhere different each night. That's very easy to do. We've done that many times. Anywhere along the wild Atlantic way. There's enough villages and towns and cities um, that, You're never going to be where you're pushing your driving to get somewhere in time for your next overnight stay. Some of the best places we've stayed, you mentioned Donegal. That's probably my favorite city too. No, no. Oh yeah. We stayed in Donegal, but that's not the one I mentioned. I mentioned the one in Doolin. Oh, well, yeah. Doolin was my favorite village to to stay in. Traditional music. I love the port down there and just watching the waves on a really wild Atlantic day. I mean, those waves were incredible crashing against the cliffs, rocking the boats. It was very well, cool. In our show notes, we'll put the places we stayed in and what we thought of them. I don't, I'm trying to think of we any bad stays. I don't think we did. No. Every one thing I really realized about traveling around Ireland is they're really happy to have you there. And they were like that before the pandemic. I think they're doubly like that now. Sure. Everybody, everybody mentioned it to us about how important it was that the economy is finally coming back. The visitors are finally coming back. They were so happy to see us. So that just makes it that much better when you're welcome. Check out the Wild Atlantic Way. Don't just go to Dublin. Go out into the countryside. Do a little driving. It's not hard and it's so beautiful and fun. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Streets and Eats. If you liked what you heard, please show us some love, hit the like button and leave us a review, maybe even subscribe so you don't miss any future podcasts. Also, we'd love it if you joined us on our Facebook private group, Streets and Eats, where we just have an ongoing conversation about all things travel. Ciao for now.